So thank you, James, for that introduction. And thank you also to the Thoroughbred Breeding Association for inviting me here today. I'm very excited to be here to talk about the um, results I have so far from my fellowship. I'm currently one year in, and hopefully I can excite you as well about the work that we're doing and hopefully be able to provide some novel options for worm control in the future. So firstly, I just want to give you a little bit of background about myself and where I come from. So I qualified as a vet um, from Liverpool University in 2007. I then went to clinical practice for a few years. I did an internship in equine medicine and surgery at Liverpool also, before coming back to, do, um, to research to do a PhD at Liverpool, looking at novel options for controlling um, small strong glass or cyathostomins in horses. And obviously that brings us up to date where uh, I am today at the University of Cambridge performing my postdoctoral fellowship, which is very generously funded by the HBLB, TBA and the EBF. So first of all, I just want to give some background as to why I'm doing the research that I'm doing and also sort of explain the theory behind the questions that I'm asking about whether the, we can design some novel options for controlling worms in horses. So as many of you know, um, the small strong gars, which is all the cyathostomins, which are the worms that I'm currently focusing on, are the most uh, abundant gast gastrointestinal worm of horses and they lead to a range of clinical problems. They're associated with um, various types of colic, they can cause weight loss and um, in addition, in severe cases where, where there are very high burdens, they can lead to a condition known as larval cyathostomonosis, which is a result of the mass emergence of larvae um, from the large intestine where the parasites develop, which has a very high mortality rate of 50%. And although this is a sporadic clinical um, problem, it is obviously something that if we lose control over worm infections, we'll, we'll start to see more commonly. So the animals that are particularly at risk of parasite infections are those co-grazing in large groups, young animals whose immunity has not developed um, as much as the older animals, and also any immune compromised animals, for example, at certain points in pregnancy and if they have any other disease problems. And finally, um, there is a, a some sort of type of horse known as a wormy horse, for want of a better term. And this describes the fact that within any herd of horses, um, the majority of horses, this graph represents a sort of distribution of parasites within a herd, the majority of animals will have very little or no parasites. And it will only be a very few animals, or roughly 10% of animals within a herd that carry the majority of the parasites. And there's, we know very little about what determines whether, which animals have low and high burdens, and this is something that I'm interested in finding more about. So, the reason that I'm doing the research I'm doing is because, as I'm sure many of you are aware, we're starting to see um, alarming reports regarding the effectiveness of the drugs that we currently control these infections with. So this is a global problem. There have been reports of problems in countries around Europe, Finland, other, on the other side of the world, Brazil, for example, Estonia, Ukraine, Germany, and also particularly in thoroughbred stud farms in the UK. So this is a global problem and, um, and it's something that really is um, we need to do something about sooner rather than later. So what are the implications of resistance? Well, if resistance continues to develop, then not because the drugs that we're currently using will become less effective, we're going to have to use them more often in order to control parasite infections. So we're going to start to see increased costs due to having to use treatments more frequently. And should the problem get worse and we actually start to lose an element of control over parasites, we'll see negative effects on growth rates, particularly in young stock. And finally, if we completely lose control of um, these infections and drugs aren't working at all, then you will see outbreaks of severe clinical disease and this will affect the young stock in particular as they're particularly prone to larval cyathostomonosis. So how are we tackling this problem as um, a veterinary profession? Well, which I'm sure you've all heard about, the main sort of um, approach which has been taken so far is to try and slow the development of drug resistance to parasites. And this is by using a test and treat um, regime whereby you, you only treat the animals which have high levels of parasites. And that reduces the pressure on parasites to develop drug resistance. 
And I'm happy to say that a number of um, large breeding establishments in the UK have taken up this um, scared type of worming regime and we are seeing positive effects in terms of slowing the spread of resistance. However, once resistance is in populations of parasites, and inevitably we're going to have to continue to use the drugs that we're using, we will start to see the resistance worsening over a period of time. And therefore, the next potential solution is to develop new drugs. Well, this is really in the hands of the drugs companies, and there have actually been a number of novel drugs licensed for use in veterinary species over the last 10 years, and none of them have been developed for use in horses and this could be for financial reasons or for safety reasons, and they may eventually come to horses. However, another problem which has been highlighted with these new drugs is that people having used them for two or three years in sheep and cattle are already seeing drug resistance developing quite quickly to these new drugs. So it isn't a problem which is going to go away, so I, we need to find alternative ways of looking at the problem. And this is what I'm particularly interested in, is whether we can develop Alternative solutions that can be used alongside wormers and test and treat protocols in order to improve our control of these parasites and also um, reduce our reliance on drugs so that we can help further slow the spread of resistance to the drugs that we still have available. And in order to do this, we need to really have a deeper understanding as to the fundamental biology of the relationship between the horse and the parasite and what defines this scenario, which I will come back to briefly, whereby the majority of horses actually have very low parasite burdens, they're at low risk of clinical disease, they're not going to be having any significant um, detrimental effects on their growth and performance. So we want to try and harness this in natural resistance to infection. So what I came to think about was, well, so what, how can we go about looking at this relationship in more depth and what might be other important factors which influence how a horse responds to a parasite infection? And look, thinking about where the um, parasites are, res are residing within the horse, the most obvious thing to look at was the gut bacteria because the worms are surrounded by hundreds of thousands of different gut bacteria. And we now know from recent research in many species of animal that gut bacteria actually has a profound effect on um, the host metabolism growth and most importantly on host immunity and on responses to infection. So your gut bacteria in you now will be defining how your immune system is functioning on a daily basis. And what I'm interested in is whether there is a relationship between the worms and the gut bacteria and are, is susceptibility to worm infection um, linked to certain types of gut bacteria and vice versa and therefore could we potentially manipulate this situation. So there may be some bacterial groups which promote um, your immune system to respond positively to a worm infection and eliminate it, whereas there might be others which can actually have the opposite effect and dampen your immune responses. And for any of you who are interested more in this, um, the theory of behind this, this work, then we have recently published a review in Trends in Parasitology um, where we look into all of the evidence for a relationship between bacteria and parasites in the intestines and look into how we can harness this for clinical benefit in all veterinary species. So coming back to my project, well, the overall aims of the project, um, having discussed that theory, were to compare the gut bacteria between um, broodmares and yearlings on a thoroughbred stud with high and low parasite burdens to see whether there is any difference in the gut bacteria between animals which naturally develop high levels of parasites and those which naturally have some resistance. And secondly, because when looking at the gut bacteria in live animals, you have to rely on faecal samples. Um, and we know that the bacteria which are in your feces aren't necessarily the same as those that are in higher up in your intestine, um, where the worms are actually um, residing, I'm also looking at the gut bacteria at the site of the infection in the large intestine in post-mortem cases, and looking also at how the animal's immune system is responding to parasite infection and different gut bacteria. So today I'm just going to present to you the, the um, results of the first part of the study, which I performed in autumn, um, where I have looked at the, my first cohort of broodmares. And in order to perform this study, I screened the entire cohort of broodmares on a um, UK thoroughbred stud farm. 
and it took repeated egg counts in order to define two groups of animals which were had a high, consistently higher levels of egg shedding and those which had consistently zero egg shedding and therefore were presumed to be negative for parasites. These animals were matched by age and also paddock in which they were residing at the time and they all had a, the same diet and um, animals were excluded if they'd had any medical intervention or any other drugs during the period of the study. So we took samples on day naught and then treated with a wormer. And then I repeated studies two days later and two weeks later to look at the effect of removing the parasites from the animal in addition to the difference between the two groups at the start. So in order to analyse these samples, we used state-of-the-art next-generation sequencing of the bacterial DNA within each sample. And this allows us to look at hundreds of thousands of bacteria within any tiny aliquot of um, faeces from, from the animal. And this is a relatively new technique which has revolutionised our understanding of bacteria um, in relation to health and disease in all mammals. And so this, it's really exciting to be able to use this tool to look at the problem that we have with parasites in horses. So this is the, um, a chart just showing the difference between high and low worm burden horses in terms of their gut bacteria within these groups. And the blue, ho the blue group here are horses with a high worm burden, and the red um, are horses with a low worm burden. And each point represents an animal, and all of the hundreds of thousands of bacteria that we measured in that animal. And its position on the graph shows how similar it is to the other animals on the graph. And as you can see, the horses with a high versus a low worm burden separate into two clear groups on this graph, showing that their bacterial composition is significantly different based on whether they have parasites or not. And interestingly, when we treated these animals, we saw a, we just saw a definite shift in the gut bacteria. So red here is the day zero sampling, blue is two days after treatment, and grey is two weeks after treatment. So you can clearly see that removal of the parasite from the system also changes the gut bacteria. So there's a definite relationship um, that we've identified here. And another measurement which we looked at was the diversity of the bacteria within each animal. And this is a measure of the number of different types of bacteria in, in the animal's gut. And you can see here that the high burden animals, sorry, the high burden animals tend to have a higher bacterial diversity, so a higher number of different types of bacteria compared to the lower burden animals. And this is an interesting finding because this is actually in the, in the limited amount of studies that have been done globally in, in other species looking at worm and bacteria interactions, this is actually something that has been consistently found. So we're seeing the same thing as horses as we see in other species, that worms increase diversity of the gut bacteria. And again, just to support these findings, after treatment, we saw a significant reduction in diversity after removal of the parasite. So we then looked more closely at what specific bacteria were causing these differences between the groups. And there were many different sort of um, differences, but one of the most significant ones in the horses with high worm burdens was a bacterial group called TM7, which is actually when I looked at the literature, has been associated with inflammatory disease um, or intestinal inflammatory disease in other species, specifically in humans. So this could quite feasibly be associated with the inflammation which is caused by a patent worm infection. And in animals with low worm burdens, we saw that they had increased levels of methanobacteria and another group called dehalobacterium. And as you can probably infer from the name of methanobacteria, these are actually linked to methane production. And therefore, um, although we'd need to validate this finding, it is possible that, methano, that the methane production may produce an inhospitable environment for the worm, for example, which results in a low, the lower worm burdens that we're seeing in these animals. So finally, I just want to touch on the application of this knowledge because a lot of it at the moment is very fundamental, just looking at basic, the basic biology of the situation. And I want to just allude to what may be coming in the future in terms of how we can use this knowledge in order to tackle worm problems on stud farms. <laughs>
and one of them is potentially designing a probiotic which is custom made in order to supplement with bacteria which we know are linked to promoting a low worm burden. And interestingly, there has actually been a study in mice which shows that supplementation with probiotic followed by infection with um, worms produces a significantly lower worm burden. As you can see in this graph here, this, this group here had probiotics and this did, and, and you can see that it does have an effect on immunity to infection in this mouse model. Therefore, it's definitely feasible that this could be reproduced in another mammalian model, such as the horse. And additionally, another approach might be to use prebiotics, whereby you're actually feeding different groups of bacteria in the animal in order to increase the amount of bacteria within the intestines. And this has actually been shown to be a very effective method in reducing parasite levels in pigs. Um, and this graph here shows a study in pigs where prebiotics were given to a group of animals versus a normal diet, and you can see there was a significant reduction in worm burden related to this particular prebiotic. And we're still a way off this in horses, however, this is, this is where we're headed with this type, you know, with the research that we're doing and, and why we're trying to understand more about the relationships between the bacteria and the worms in these animals. So just to conclude, um, so far this study has shown that cyathostome infection is linked with global changes in the gut bacteria and also bacterial diversity. TM7 is associated with high worm burdens and methanobacteria and dehalobacterium are associated with low worm burdens. And so moving forward from this, I've just finished sampling from a group of young stock where I'm repeating the exact same study in order to, on the, with young stock on the same farm in order to validate whether this, these findings are consistent between different groups of animals which are of a different age and potentially receiving different food. And secondly, I'm also, I've also just started sampling for the post-mortem study where I'm going to be looking at the um, parasites and bacteria at the site of infection and also host response to infection. And finally, I would like to say a huge thank you to a number of people. My supervisor, Cinzia Cantacesi at the University of Cambridge, who is working on human um, worm interactions, and also um, my mentor, James Wood, head of department at Cambridge University, and our PhD student, Timothy Jenkins, who's working on very similar studies in humans, and we collaborate a lot and discuss our data a lot, so he's been very helpful with this project. And finally, Jane Hodgkinson at the University of Liverpool, who's had um, a role to play in the parasitology element of this project. And also, I'd like to say a huge thank, to, thank you to the STUD, um, who, for obvious reasons, I won't say who they are today, but they've been enormously helpful in um, helping with sample collection and arranging these studies. And finally, an enormous thanks to my funders, the HBLB, TBA, EBF. Thank you so much. And I think it shows enormous vision to fund a project like this, um, which is quite blue sky thinking. But really, I think that we need to go this way in order to try and mitigate the problem of anthelminting resistance, which could have a huge negative impact on the industry in the near future if we don't try and do something about it. So thank you very much. first results from a really exciting study and um, we're really looking forward to where this is going to take us and whether we're going to be buying yoghurt in bulk or yeah. <laughs> um, in the future. Um, and uh, have we got any questions now? Um, yes. Uh, I'm sticking my neck right out. Um, you used ivermectin as the wormer of choice in your study. Yeah. My understanding is that ivermectin is one of the chief causes of um, worm resistance. Um, I've had personal experience of this, horses coming back from a very reputable new market stud, recently wormed. I wasn't happy with them. I used an ordinary chemical wormer and it looked as if I was in the snake house at the zoo. Can you comment on your use of ivermectin in this study, please? <laughs> well, I think probably the worms that you're referring to are Parascaris, um, which there is known to be a widespread resistance problem um, with ivermectin and Parascaris. Um, 
However, weirdly, cyathosomins, which is the worm that I'm working on, but they, there's sort of an opposite thing here. Like, so the fenbendazole worm or the panicure wormer is something which is more effective against the parascaris, and what and the ivermectin is more effective against cyathosome. So on the stud farm which I was working on, and I checked this obviously as part of the study, ivermectin is still effective. So I saw a complete elimination of worm burdens after two weeks. And I also selected animals which didn't have a co-infection at the time with another parasite. So I knew that I was purely looking at, at the effect of ivermectin on this one type of worm. Thank you very much. I told you about No, that's fine. <laughs> um, no. It's a, it's a good question. Yeah. If I may defend us in Newmarket, um, we, we, uh, many studs now have moved to um, worming and then following up with sampling because we, we have to know if we're being effective and where we're being effective and, and looking for the 80-20 the rule of the 20% that carry the 80% of the burden. So. Um, we're very much aware of drug limitations and um, focusing our management on sending animals home uh, as clean as possible. Um, everybody in Newmarket's focused on this, so we're aware that there are problems and we're acting on, on um, our results from we sample animals three weeks after worming and, and act on and act on those results. So um, we had a bad experience. I, I can understand it. It might happen, but we really are doing our best to focus our efforts. And, and, and Laura's study, I think particularly with the, the bacteria side of things, which is something nobody's looked at, um, could lead us in the right direction to um, uh, refine our efforts here. Any more questions? Yes. Um, we, I'm actually based with Oxford University, and we've done a lot of research into worms in human beings, largely tape worms, and we've used CASA system, and very recently, our professor there has actually transferred good flora from a living, breathing human being into another human being that's possibly getting infected with worms, and it has, you know, stabilised the surface. Yeah. You call it what, sorry? In the <laughs> Sounds great. Well, that's actually a technique which is being used to treat some sort of all sorts of diseases in humans with, that were related to gut bacteria, such as inflammatory bowel disease and things. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think the logistics of that in a horse might be quite well, horrific, we have, but... We have, we have <laughs> done it in, in odd cases with um, chronic, chronic problems yeah. in some young stock, actually. We have, we have done that, um, but it's not done on any great scale. But it's sort of... what. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that provides more evidence that this is definitely a, a valid um, area to be looking at when thinking about novel ways to control parasites. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I. Well, there's a difference between resistance, overt resistance, and also like a reduced um, length of time which the drug is working for. So I think there's quite a lot of evidence that the drugs aren't working for as long as they were when they were originally licensed, which shows that the parasites are beginning to develop resistance to them. But yeah, it's a sort of grey area sometimes, as to, there's, which usually means that a, a proportion of the parasites in the population are resistant. However, 
it, it works well enough to provide you with a clinical bent effect when you use the drug. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. Is this in humans? Oh, is it? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll have a look. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much again, Laura.